the shade from the guttermost to the uttermost. Welcome to the Word of a King podcast. It's where culture clashes with our calling, where preaching is more important than popularity, where we rightly divide and properly apply the scriptures, where we put to rest common and controversial issues. We do this by looking to the Word of a King. The key to understand the Word of God is for the author to show you what the thing says. If you understand that book, you get for the author. Then he opened their understanding. Amen. Welcome back to the Word of a King podcast. I am your host, Chad Reese, and with me, my co-host, Brother Brian Bean. And we uh, had to take a couple weeks off just because of life and the schedule. Um, but Brother Brian, we just finished up the Awake Bible Conference, and I know I had a wonderful time. And so maybe just for a minute or two, what, what's your thoughts on the conference, Brother? Wonderful. Awesome. It was the blowout of the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. It was great. Uh, great music, great preaching, great teaching, great fellowship. I met several people who listen to the podcast, a brother from Grand Rapids, brother yeah. Matt. Amen. And Amen. He, we did popcorn preaching Friday morning, actually. And yeah. which, praise the Lord, you're a gracious pastor. You let every single person, even people that you've never heard preach or don't know what they would preach, you let everybody up there, I think 10, 11 guys yeah. up there to do 15 minutes of popcorn preaching. And Brother Matt got up there and he's from Grand Rapids, hour and a half or so from here, maybe. Yeah. And But he listened to the podcast. I met several other people, Brother Elam, who's a pastor, just took over like uh, in Cincinnati area, yep. pastor of the church. And uh, he listened to the podcast and got to meet him and talk to, talk to him. So, yeah, it, it was great. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I thought all the men in the podcast, uh, I'm sorry, in the popcorn preacher, they just did a great job. I mean, yeah. it was edifying. It was exciting and it was a blessing. I truly, truly um, just enjoyed all the men preaching. And I, I love to see just the different men, how they handled that uh, kind of time constraint, that 15 minutes. Of course, yours was exciting and filled with scripture. And, uh, but you know, and I'm not saying this about any other guy, they all did a great job, but we were kind of trained that way, right at PBI and, and plenty of, you know, time restraints and 15 minute sermon. Right. You know, so you were, yeah. you were used to it. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, no problem with the yeah. time. Yeah. So I got it, a lot to work on, but that's a time thing. I'm, I can follow a timer without any problems, but yeah, you yeah, down, to the, down to the second. Uncle Jeff was there. He yeah. uh, was a guest of brother Sluters. He preached on the worm and Psalm 22 and yeah. it's a type of worm and then turn it into a, was he the one turned into a butterfly? No, you, you're, oh, that was Kevin Mann. Yeah, talking I'm about, mixing. Yeah, messages. I'm morphing messages. He morphing messages. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, metamorphosis of the butterfly, you're metamorphosing messages. <laughs> yeah. <but. laughs> brother Matt did Eternal Security. That was really good. Yeah. All, all kinds of mess. I met Brother Clapp, who's from a, another a, kind of a local church around yeah, here. Absolutely. Close church, a fellow Bible believing church. He was a blessing. And, Amen. Yeah, it was great. And all the, uh, you want to, whatever you want to call them, the main speakers, I, I just thought they all did a fantastic job. Uh, obviously, Brother Andrew, always glad to have him, a great preacher. And he was all right. <laughs> he was no, all right? No, he was great. He was great. <laughs> amen, amen. Praise brother. the Lord. He was good. And then uh, Brother Alltop is just blessed Ooh. and talented, and boy, he can play and sing. And he can preach, you yes. know, <laughs> I'm always envious. I know I shouldn't say that, but, but just be honest, uh, you look at these preachers and, you know, they can preach and they can sing. Brother, I can't sing at all. You can sing. <laughs> you, know, you could bust out in a song in the middle of a sermon. I, I can can't. carry a tune. I yeah. I can play. I know what notes are and keys. Yeah. If that's, I do know that stuff. But, Amen. but uh, anyways, Jack not and only. Jill, yeah, Jack, all oh, wonderful. Priest, Jack and Jill, the two dogs on the fence and the light. Oh, man, I can't get into it. But yeah. that's not what the podcast is about. But it was a, we were blessed. Yeah. And then uh, Brother Kevin Mann, again, just the, the nuggets in the King James Bible and just. Number man. Yeah. I could sit and listen to him all day. Just all the truths that he has. And obviously, um, and Joe Tillis. Brother I Tillis, just, yeah. uh, Brother Tillis did a wonderful wow. job. Just fantastic preaching. and Convicting. Yeah, convicted. I, I just couldn't have asked for a better lineup when I when I prayed and asked these men to come in. I felt they complimented each other. They kind of built off each other. And it was just a wonderful meeting. We were packed out. And uh, praise the Lord, we did do the addition to both the bathroom and the sanctuary because we wouldn't have been in a house, all those folks there. 
Uh, you know, I know it's not about numbers and start talking about numbers and some of the brethren get uncomfortable. But, you know, for, for a smaller church, it's exciting and see God's hand. And I, I think one night we probably easily had over 200 people there. So um, what a blessing that was. A great conference. I think we have 164 seats now. Gerald and I counted, but it was something 160 something. Yeah. You talk about before we added Brother Gary's in there, right? Yeah. Before the accident. Yeah, just correct. And then um, when when you started with five years ago, wasn't it? 10, 15, 20 people? With my family, we were probably in the 20s, low 20s. I, I've heard conflict, different numbers. Of course, I can't really remember. But um, Brother Johnny, Cisco, some of those guys came in early days. They would say they'd come to church and there might be 15 people there. You know, I, I think there was probably low 20s and I counted six at the time. Of course, my my mother is still alive. So there was probably high teens and then my family brought low 20s. So, yeah. And now to be wow. where we're at five years later. And uh, Man, glad to be on board. Yeah, it's a blessing to have you, brother. <laughs> and uh, we won't you know, waste a whole lot more time talking about it. But I'll tell you, um, it's just a blessing. And, and God is still in the saving business. There was four uh, souls saved, four professions of faith during the conference. Praise the Lord for mm. that. And, uh, you know, just uh, Lighthouse is being built on the word of God, exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're out there street preaching. We're out there knocking on doors. We're out there singing in the park. So public ministries do work. <laughs> People are excited about it. Amen. And uh, so it's been good. It's been good. Now we're going to shift gears. And I always say there's two controversial subjects. Now, I don't believe they're controversial, but um, some of the brethren do, and definitely some of the lost world does, and that's understandable. Uh, but there's two subjects, Brother Brian, if I ever get feedback or any controversy, it's uh, first one is the gap, and there has been a request to do a podcast on the gap, and we'll probably do that in the near future. Looking forward to it. But the other subject, I get a lot of feedback, and some good, some negative, and that's okay. Um, but it's on the subject, and this is today's podcast, that God does not love sinners. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I you know, see so. lots of bumper stickers and billboards that would say contrary. Yeah. And churches. Yeah, and churches and Christians and preachers. And so that's we're going to have just a good discussion about this subject. And, you know, oftentimes when I preach this, um, I get good feedback afterwards and good conversation. Again, some negative. That's OK. Uh, but I think sometimes, Brother Brian, I don't have the opportunity like I do now to really sit and explain what I mean. And you know how it is, brother, when you're preaching, uh, you're on, you've got this time frame, plus you got it like uh, your points and your theme, and you're trying to uh, stay on track. So you don't really get to develop the thought or maybe expound like we're able to on the podcast. So I hope that you stay tuned. I hope you listen to the end. And by the end of this, I hope you at least see the position that we're coming from and uh, maybe Pray about what we're saying. So I think to start this off, Brother Brian, let, let's talk just as an introduction briefly about the nature of God and some of the God's attributes. And again, we won't spend a lot of time on this because this is not really the topic. But I do believe understanding the nature of God helps us understand the subject. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree. Yeah. Yes. So, so with that said, Brother Brian, if, and again, we don't have to do a big exhaustive study on this. What are some of the attributes or nature of God that come to your mind that, that you think are pertinent to this specific discussion? Say so God is holy. Yeah. Isaiah six, Isaiah gets a glimpse of heaven, gets caught up yeah. to heaven and a seraphim. And I dwell among people of unclean lips and the seraphim. Seraphim puts the hot coal and he hears, holy, 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 Revelation 4. Amen. John gets caught up to heaven and he sees same situation. He sees four beasts and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. So I think safe to say holy is one of God's attributes. Maybe, maybe, uh, and I agree 100%. And maybe just in your own words, what, what, <clears throat> what would you describe holy as? Um, Pure. Yeah. But righteous, sinless. Right. And I, and I think those are all good uh, words to describe holy. And obviously that's the opposite of sinful and, you know, wicked and evil. Mm -hmm. And so the God of the Bible, the God we serve, he is holy. And I think that is so important. 
Um, we'll talk about some more of the attributes of God, but whenever we have this discussion, we have to understand that. We have to remember we're dealing with the holy God. We're not dealing with flesh and blood. We're not dealing with you and I. We're not dealing with the moral standard of what we think is right or wrong. We're dealing with the holy God. Uh, what that's in Hebrews our, it says our God is a consuming fire. Right, right. So you, no man can see God. No man can stand before God. You'd be consumed if you can't even look at the sun, you couldn't be on the sun for a, more than a right. <laughs> you couldn't be on the sun anywhere near the sun, or you'd disintegrate. How about God that made the sun? The stars are not even pure in His sight. The Bible says, mm. "How much more unholy or filthy and abominable is man that drinketh iniquity like water?" I think that's in Job somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great verse. But yeah, God is a consuming fire. He's holy. He's pure, and we can understand some of God's attributes, but we can't even fathom that. Right. And that's the kind of God we're we're going to be looking at. We, we all know God is love and God's long suffering and merciful. But there's the other side that Absolutely. most Christians, even Bible believing or Baptist or fundamental, they don't want to talk about God's other side of just holy and sinless and pure and righteous and a God that would make a hell. And I'm probably jumping ahead. Oh, no, you're good. That's kind of the attributes of God. God is not just positive. Positive and sweet and dripping syrup and yeah. candy and uh, <laughs> rainbows and hugs. And right. Wild, yeah. Right? Cotton candy and God's uh, this fake effeminate uh, Santa Claus that people have created. That's not the God of the Bible. And that's what we'll be looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and again, with that, so we know that God is holy and all those attributes that we kind of tied into holiness. And, and you already stated this, but because he is holy, he's also a God of wrath. Um, you know, that that is what the time of Jacob's trouble is about. That's the culmination. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, thank God he came as a lamb mm. to be slain. He came as a lamb to take away the sin of the world. But listen, we know that he came the first time as a lamb, but he's coming the second time as a lion. Mm. And he's coming back in his wrath. And, you know, the day of the wrath is come. And uh, so we understand because God's holy. He's also a God of wrath. Yes. And, and again, so this is just setting the scene to why I believe the Bible teaches that God does not love sinners. And again, just stay with me. If you're listening and you're viewing, we'll develop that thought a little bit more. We're just laying the foundation about the character and nature of God. Uh, one more, uh, other two more, but the one I want to get to before we deal with the one everyone likes to talk about is because God is holy and because he's a God of wrath, we know that he's also God of judgment. He's going to judge. And we know that's true for the Christian at the, the judgment seat of Christ. We know it's true for the nations at the judgment of the nations. We know it's true at the great white throne judgment. And so God is a God of judgment. Um, anything else you want to add in regards to that or any other attributes besides the last one that we'll talk about? <laughs> I think you covered it all up. I know Peter, Second Peter says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm probably jumping ahead, but don't confuse that with love. Long suffering is suffering long. It's right. God's putting up and putting up and putting up and yeah. putting up with sinners and blasphemers and pornographers and child molesters right. and people beating their wives and unjust judge and filthy liberals and uh, homosexual agenda and all, yeah. this, all that stuff God puts up with it and allows man to breathe. But don't confuse that with God's love. No, that's an excellent okay. point, brother. And, and again, that kind of segues into the attribute that a lot of people want to, I believe, overemphasize. And I say that, um, understand what I say. And we understand the very attribute that the Bible is clear that God is love. Amen. Uh, first John four, eight. And thank God for that. I'm glad that we don't serve a, you know, just this God up in heaven that just gets joy and beating people down and sadistic and all that. No, God is love, but you have to view the love of God in balance to the rest of his characteristics. Right. And so before we talk about, the condition of man, lost man I'm talking about, man who's not been born again, man who has not been saved. Before we talk about the condition that he is before a holy God, you've already segued way into it. And maybe we'll just spend another minute or two talking about it. And so if, if God is holy and, and God is going to judge and is a God of wrath, then why doesn't God just consume us? Well, you already raised one of those points, which is good. He's long-suffering. 
And you did a good job talking about that. Obviously, we have the long suffering God in Second Peter uh, chapter three, verse nine. Um, but beyond the long suffering of God, I believe you also have God's mercy, right? Um, God's mercy and God's desire what his thoughts are to us, what his desires are towards us. And so I think we need to consider those things too. And this will help us balance out the subject. But what do you got there, brother? I like it. You always know when I have a verse, you can just tell. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Exodus 35, which, or Exodus 34, verse five. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. It's Moses. Mm-hmm. And proclaim the name of the Lord. This is where God's going to show Moses his glory. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and That's abundant it. in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and the fourth generation. So there you see both attributes. Right. So, but as it applies to Moses, God is showing him he's merciful and he forgives iniquity. Absolutely. And so what we're saying is, and again, we'll get into the condition of a lost man, but the reason God doesn't just judge us and the reason he doesn't just pour out his wrath upon us is because he is long suffering. Amen. Because he is merciful. Again, I know this is a very common verse and very familiar, but Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, Hmm. it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Again, it's because of his mercy. And so I have that chart that I have illustrated with the verses and all that. And I have a lost man with describes all his conditions in He's standing on some thin ground. Below him is the fires of hell. And there's some pillars that are keeping him Mm. from being to fall into those fires of hell. And, of course, they are the pillar of long suffering. That's good. The pillar of mercy and the pillar of God's desires and his thoughts towards us and what he thinks of the the expected end and what he says there. And I think those in Ezekiel chapter 18 and. And I think the other reference in Ezekiel 33 there. So God does have a desire. God does have thoughts to us and he does have an expected end. And of course, we know that God's desire is for men to repent and men to get saved. But those are the pillars that keep man from falling to the pits of hell. And, and again, I'm sure there's other pillars, other attributes that you could put in there. But those are just some simple ones to help the viewing audience, listening audience understand why that we're not consumed, why we are not judged, why we're not facing God's wrath. But before we go on, let's talk about now what the Bible says, not not what the world says, not what Christianity says, but what the Bible says about lost man. And Brother Brian, I'll I'll turn over to you and allow you just to give some thoughts on uh, the lost man's condition before a holy God and what the Bible says. But I know I think we've said this on the podcast already once, and it's such a true statement. We we see back in the garden that God formed and fashioned man after his image. We know he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. But in return, I think what man has done is formed and fashioned a God uh, after their image. Yeah. And that's a fallen image. It's good. And so they take the attributes that they want God to have. Even Christian. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Even Christian. Yes. And they view God in that light. And brethren, we ought not do that. We ought to view God in the light that he reveals through his Holy Scripture. So with that said, how does God view lost man? He loves him. That's it. That's all the Bible says is God loves him every second. (laughs) (laughs) So, well, well, and and obviously we, we all understand the sarcasm and the joke there. But before you start going down this list, I know we say this every time we have this discussion. I say this when I preach this. But think about this. If that was true and I go to a lost person, I say, God loves you. And I just want to let you know today, you know, you you really need to get saved. But I just want to let you know God loves you. And you should tell them that because they've never heard that. (laughs) That's that's all the world. That's all churches tell them. Billboards, stickers, everything, radio ads of Christian, Calvin, doesn't matter what kind of denomination. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Right. Go ahead. And and then (laughs) say, Brother Brian tells that person, he runs into him uh, six months later and says, hey, I just want to let you know God loves you. And you need to get saved, but 
God loves you. God loves you. And they hear that throughout their life. And all of a sudden, they, they, they never get saved. They never uh, come to a, a state of knowledge where they repent of who they are and trust Jesus Christ for salvation. And they die and they lift up their eyes in hell, burning. And, and then, you know, they get caught up at the great white throne judgment. And then they're going to get cast in the lake of fire. I, I could see that lost man looking at us and saying, I thought God loved me. What kind of love yeah, is that? Yeah, thanks a lot for that message telling me God loves me. Right. But it really helped him out. Right. I mean, again, seriously, if that is the love of God, getting burning in hell and then be cast in a lake of fire, then I don't want the love of God. I'll pass. Yeah, I'll pass too, brother. <laughs> but, but of course, we, we're totally being sarcastic because that is not the love of God. Or, or what if um, God loves you, God, that's all they hear, God loves right. you, and they don't, before they die and go to hell... There's somebody on the street corner, some whack job, right. like Pastor Chad or I, and we say, Jesus Christ died for sinners. Are you saved? You must be born again. If you reject the free gift of eternal life, you're going to burn in hell forever. Right. They think we're kooks, right. which we are, but we're peculiar people. We accept sure, that. Amen. No problem with that. But 150 years ago, Methodists or mm -hmm. every church would preach on hell. Now nobody preaches on hell. So when they hear preach on hell, one of the reasons they're so resistant to other than sure. being lost – and not have an understanding or anything is all they hear is love, 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 right. love, love from every church and every corner of every stripe of every denomination. All they hear is love. Every billboard, every T-shirt, every bumper sticker. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And then somebody knocks on our door and mentions hell or somebody stands on the street corner. They see a gospel track of a, you know, a Jack Chick track where somebody's in hell burning and they immediately don't want it because they're resistant to it, which be, they should be. Right, because that's not a God of love. No. And, and it's and, so rare for us to hear about hell because yeah, that's not love. <laughs> right, right. And, and so, again, what man has done is man has formed and fashioned a God in his own image or a God after the image they want God to be. But, again, that brings us back as Bible believers. What does the Bible say? So what does the Bible say? about lost man. How does God view a lost man, Brother Brian? Now, okay, I'm going to, I don't know how many, I can, you know me, I can rattle off pretty quickly here, but. Yeah, let's just kind of go through them let's slowly. See, let's see if, slowly. Come yeah, on. let's expound on. Go ahead. This doesn't, let's see if this, these are synonyms for love, of course. The lost are called unrighteous, mm. right? Yeah. Darkness, Belial, these are, these are 2 Corinthians 6. What fellowship hath righteousness with right. unrighteousness? Right. What concord hath Christ with Belial, light with darkness? Sure. Infidels, idols, mm -hmm. unclean thing. They're said to be dead in sins. That's right. Ephesians 2. Yeah, absolutely. Children of wrath. Mm. By nature, children of wrath, even as others. Ephesians yeah. 2, Pauline. Aliens, strangers. It, it gets better or worse. Yeah. Far off. They are without the following, Ephesians 2.12, without Christ, yeah. without God, without strength mm. in due time, when we were yet without strength, without excuse, without fear, clouds without water, mm. <laughs> twice dead, plucked up by the roots, without understanding, having no hope, Right. enemies of God. Yeah, that's a big one. Enemies of God. So enemies of God. If when we were enemies, we were yeah. reconciled to God by the death of his son. Absolutely. And it's just like, so if, they're, they're, if lost man is God's enemy, then how are they, the love of God towards them? Again, the, this, this idea, even just with the list you just started, we're going to keep going. And they get worse. Yeah. It just doesn't reconcile with That's this idea love. that God loves you. And again, we're talking about present tense in that relationship where that sinner can say, yes, God actively loves me. We're not talking about, we're going to clarify. We're not talking about that. God didn't demonstrate the love of God. We're not even saying, obviously I want to make this clear. We're not saying the love of God's not available to the contrary. The love of God is available to all. Man. What we're saying is God does not actively and presently love a lost man while he's in his lost conditions. They are not experiencing the love of God. All right, let's continue with this list. They're experiencing something, which we'll get into eventually on my list. Yeah. All right, good for nothing. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ said that, Sermon on the Mount. You're right. Good for nothing and dunghill. Children of disobedience of your father, the devil. Yeah. We got filthy, abominable, and here we go. Here's the, here's the good ones. 
condemned already. John was it three yeah. eighteen? He believeth on him is not condemned. He that yeah. believeth not, that's a lost person, is condemned already. The wrath of God abideth on him. That's John three thirty six. Mm-hmm. They're in their sins. Here's I. Let's well, on seven elevens next. That's yeah. that's a really good one. Let's, there. let's stop the about yeah. the wrath. No, no, just for a moment. I want you to continue. But again, we are Bible believers. We believe every word is pure and perfect. And even the tense, the tense of the word matters. You, you talked about there in John three thirty six. Quote that verse again in John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son mm-hmm. shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth abideth on him. On him. That's present tense. Right. So God's wrath abideth on him, that lost person. Again, you say, well, then why aren't they consumed? We already told you because God's long suffering, Amen. God's mercy, God's desire. It's not love. Exactly. What abideth on them, present tense, in their lost condition, is the wrath of God. I just wanted to put yeah. that out because yeah. that's important. Amen. And many of these, I'm not, I know I'm not, I rattle off stuff. I'm not quoting any references. No, you're good. Most of these, probably 80%, I'm guessing, are New Testament. So, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. No, this is the God of the New Testament. Psalm 711 mm-hmm. says, God is angry at the wicked when they die and go to hell. No. no. Every day. <laughs> every day. God is angry at the wicked every day. And then Psalm 917 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell. But uh, as we said, if that's the love of God, I'll pass. Yeah. So again, brother, again, I just want the listeners, the viewers to stop and consider this. God is angry with the wicked Every day. So how can you then come behind and say, God loves you? He loves you present tense, but he's angry with you and he's going to cast you into hell. Again, I think people do this, brother, because they want to make the gospel more palatable. Yes. yes. They want to be accepted by lost people right. as view as being friendly. And, and again, I'm not advocating by no means to to just be rude or be, you know, whatever. No, the gospel is offensive enough, but we don't need to soften the blow. They need to realize who they are before a holy God. And that's what's going to bring them to salvation once they realize their sinful condition before holy God and what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross of Calvary. Mm. And once someone realizes that, they'll run to Calvary. (laughs) They'll run to the cross of Calvary. But the problem is, I believe people are presenting the gospel wrong. They're presenting God wrong. And people think, I'm okay. God loves me. Right. I was non-denomination for two years and I used to listen to Chris contemporary music and there was a song that kind of sums it up and you people probably heard this phrase that man has a God-shaped hole which I'm not even saying it's pretty goofy but I'm not even sure. saying that could could be true in a way there's God, there's a God made us to want to have fellowship with sure. him so I get all that but that's the emphasis is that Jesus will make your life better he could save your man and some of this stuff is true right you might get saved and your wife leaves you and your kids leaves you and you lose your job and you get killed for right. Jesus. So right. it's not necessarily true. And it hasn't been true throughout history for many millions of Christians who have died. But God wants to know you. And if you get to know Jesus and you sure. get in this relationship and your father made you and he made you to want to fellowship with him and your life will be better and it'll have meaning. Yeah. I'm not even going to say it's not true, but that's not the number one. You get saved too because the wrath of God abides on you Amen. and you're going to die and face a holy God and burn in hell forever. Sure. You may not like that. I don't like it. I don't like hell. Sure. You may not understand it. If I was God, doesn't you're not God. I'm not God. Right. The Bible says, show not the judge of the, all the earth do right. Yes. I just believe it. It's right for God to be this way. I've had the wrath of God on them, and it's right for God to send them in hell and burn forever because God is holy, and I'm not, and I'll never understand that. Sure. But I believe by faith the King James Bible. Amen. So I'm trying to reason it and pre- 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 present this um, message of the gospel that's just positive. It's a lie. It's out of hell. Right. And someone like us comes along and witnesses to them and talks about hell, and they don't they don't want to listen to it. Yeah, absolutely. Because all they hear is positive, and we're these kooks that talk about it as mean, angry God. 
<laughs> well, it, what it is, it's humanism repackages yes. Christianity. And, right. and they, they again, they want to present God in a manner where the Bible doesn't. And uh, so, again, it makes it more palatable. You can come out and say, you know, I'm Get just here to tell you and- God loves you. And uh, so, again, thank God that God is love. But but man must realize who he is bef- be, before a holy God and how God mm. views him. And, and again, right. he is angry. With the wicked every day. That's why they need saved, because they're lost. Yeah. And, and and until they realize. Not to fill their God-shaped hole. Right. Until they realize they're lost, they won't get saved. Yeah. I think what has happened, all that stuff you were summarizing, I was thinking about this. I've said this before. Again, Christianity wants to repackage the gospel, make it more you know friendly. And really what they want to do is they want to offer Jesus Christ as an accessory. Mm. You know, you just add him to your life. Right. Kind of like a woman adds a purse and, you know, your life's fine, but why don't you get this purse? You get this purse, you add this purse, and you'll be complete. And that's how they, they present God in the manner. No, your life is undone. You're vile, you're wicked, and there's nothing you can add to your life. What you need to do is get saved and Jesus Christ will be born again. He's not an an accessory to life. Jesus Christ is life. And Amen. until someone comes to that realization, Rich. until they come to that realization who they are before a holy God, I don't believe they're going to come and get saved because they don't realize how God views them. And you know how you know that is if you ever witness to people or when you're not going, oh, I'm good, I'm good, I don't right. need that. Right. And they're actually, they're actually right as far as they don't need the Jesus of that the world's pushing, sure. that your mega churches are pushing, that your non-offensive churches that don't ever talk about hell, that never get negative, that never preach, rebuke, reprove, rebuke, exhort, that ignore 80, 90 percent of the Bible. That's that's not all sweet and positive. And you talk to somebody, you know who needs Jesus? The guy who's drunk, the guy who's on death row, the guy that's uh, the homeless man who's uh, eating food out of a garbage can. He needs they would probably agree with it. He needs Jesus or their, uh, right. their weirdo cousin who was hooked on cocaine and got into yeah. trouble or hooked on crack. And now he got religion and now he's a better person. Okay. They, they understand he needs sure. Jesus. It worked for him, but I'm good. Right. I'm married. Right. I got a good family. I got money. I got them successful. Yeah, look and in the way they're on. right. Right. Why would they need saved? Right. Well, the Jesus that they're presenting, the most churches present, they actually don't need that Jesus. Right. Well, you need Jesus because you're lost. You're not good. You're yeah. bad. You're just as uh, evil and vile as Adolf Hitler yeah. or Charles Manson, and you need to be born again. But when we knock on all these doors, they don't see it because they don't see an angry God. That's they right. don't see their condition before a holy, righteous, angry God. So yeah, why would they get saved? And they don't need I've to be saved. I've already been told, God loves me. I'm okay. That, yeah. You know. So let me let me ask you this. We talk about these how God views a sinner. I, I want to ask you a simple question. It's not a trick question. What is the opposite of love? Yeah, what is the opposite? I won't say it. Yeah, what's the opposite? Hate. Hate. So to maybe summarize and move on from this point. I can finish my list. No, yeah, you'll go fish. You finish your list after this. There's only a few left. No, you're good. <laughs> you fish your list. But the opposite of love is hate. Does the Bible talk about who God hates? It does. It does very clearly. God, read, no, God hates sin, but he loves a sinner. Okay, that's we, what I've been told. That's what a lot of people say. Right. But I'll, I'll read this <laughs> reference. There's, there's plenty here, but I'm going to read to you Psalms chapter five. Verses oh, 04 and 5. The Bible says in Psalms 5, verse 4, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. The Bible says God hates all workers of iniquity. In, there's the hates are sin or hates them. Oh, hates them. Yeah, hate us all workers, workers of iniquity people. And uh, there's 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 uh, Psalms eleven four through seven, Proverbs six sixteen through nineteen, Romans nine thirteen, and other verses there that yeah, the, the Proverbs six. He that these six things doth the Lord hate seven are abomination. It says he that soweth discord among yeah. the brethren. That's a man. Yeah, and uh, Esau. Yes, yeah. Malachi. Yeah, one Romans nine. Yeah, and that's I think that's the Romans nine thirteen reference there. Right, and he said Esau. He he hates him, and so again, that's the person. It's not the sin, but but this is so far from modern Christianity. My my point is, it's the opposite of love is hate, and God hateth 
all workers of iniquity. So how could you go to a worker of iniquity and say God loves you when the Bible says he hates them? And and again, so let, let's continue with your list. Let's go on. Let's um, push you're on. Almost done. Your no, you're good. Uh, God is angry at the wicked every day. The wicked shall be turned into hell. Romans 3 says, whose damnation is just, mm. evil, wicked, hypocrites, cursed, fools, blind, that's Jesus Christ, Matthew 23, generation of vipers, evil, evil generation, adulterous generation, and it's, the lost are likened to tares, yeah. by Jesus Christ, Matthew 13, mm-hmm. he said, bind the tares in bundles to burn them. They're likened to bad fish. Mm. He gets a parable of a man who casts a net and he throws the bad fish aside. Not very nice. Bad fish yeah. stink and are worthless. Dogs, sows, whited sepulchers, mm. vessels of wrath, Romans chapter 9. Vessels of mercy are the saved. Yeah. Vessel of wrath, yeah. Romans 9. And I have, yeah, God hates them, which you mentioned. And All right. Yeah, that's pretty much my list, and there's some other things, but I think that's enough. For yeah, the list. definitely enough for folks to chew on. And yeah. again, I, doesn't sound like love. No, and let's let's recap this. Put this in perspective for the listeners and the viewers. This is what the Bible says. Not a commentary. Not Brother Brian. Not Brother Chad. We this, don't like this in the flesh any more than you. If you've never heard this, right? But exactly. We're Bible believers. This is what the Bible says. How God views a lost man. Now, if you can read all this list. And still want to go tell a sinner, God loves you, currently, presently in your condition. Hey, you just do whatever you want. But I'm just telling you, that is not the message of the Bible. No. And that is not how God sees a lost man. Again, they're dead. They're sinners. There's enmity between them and God. That's uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 7. They're condemned already. The wrath of God abideth on them. He hates the workers in iniquity. He's angry every day with them. And again, you just on and on, all those things of uh, mm. what Brian says he compares the lost man to, you'll come to the overwhelming conclusion that a lost man is not okay with the holy God, and he does not actively and present in their current condition love them. So that, that brings us, Brother Brian, to some passages, though, that we need to discuss and put in context with everything we discussed so far. What about John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? You know, so what do we do with verses like that? Well, go to the Greek. <laughs> no. you, you could go to the Greek. and uh, But my answer is. What I believe, if you look at John 3.16, Romans 5, 8, 1 John 3.16, 1 John 4.10, Revelation 1.5, 1 John 4, 8 through 10, 1 John 4.16, those are just some of the verses that talk about the love of God that could be viewed in light of a lost person. But every single time, again, this is where the, the tense of the, the word matters, every time it is past tense or refers back to the cross of Calvary. And so this is why I say this, and this is, again, why I think this podcast is beneficial, so people can listen, they can kind of push their emotions to the side for a moment, and listen to what we're trying to say. I believe there is no doubt that man has a special place in the heart of God, however you want to say it. We were talking a little bit before the podcast started, and I believe you go through Genesis chapter 1, you see the days of creation, and most of the days we won't sidetrack, he calls good. There's a couple of days he doesn't. Day one, he doesn't call good. He only calls the light good. And when he creates the firmament, he doesn't call that day good. But the rest of the days he calls good. But when he creates man, that sixth day, he says it is very good. Now, again, without getting chasing a rabbit, I don't believe that's a culmination of the whole week. I believe it's a summary of that day, just like how every day ended. But that day, he says it's very good. And I believe it's very good because he created man after his image on that day. And there's no doubt that man had to have a special place in the heart of God because we see the very first messianic prophecy all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, hmm. and how God was going to send his only begotten son and die for man. So there is no doubt that man had a special place in the heart of God. But here it is. Here's, here's the crux, the crux of the message, the crux of understanding this doctrine. God demonstrated God showed, God proved his love to man when he went to the cross of Calvary. But if a man 
rejects the cross of Calvary, then man, that man rejects the love of God. Man. So here's the statement. The love of God towards sinners is always a reference back to what Christ did for us and how Christ died for us. Go read all the references where it talks about the love of God towards sinners. It will always point back to the cross. So therefore, the love of God is available to all. Thank God for that, right? Thank Jesus God. Christ tasted death for every man. Every man. Praise the Lord for that. So our message is not a message of hate. Matter of fact, our message is the greatest message ever told. That's why it's the gospel. And basically what we're telling man, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself about the message that we preach, but it's okay. The greatest message ever told is to tell a lost man who's dead in trespasses and sin, who the wrath of God abideth on him, who's vile, who's undone, whose throat is like an opal and sepulcher, who could never please God, who's going to die in their sin and go to hell. We get the opportunity to tell them how they can experience the love of God personally, how they can be saved, how they can be redeemed. And that is the gospel. Jesus Christ died for them. But the point is, to get back where we're at, the love of God towards sinners is always connected back to the cross of Calvary. Right. What's your thoughts on that or, or anything else? I know I kind of went on for a moment, got to preach in there. Um, but what's your thoughts there? Totally agree. My crazy mind, you said crux, and then I like different languages in my head. Crux is Latin. Do you know for what? No. Cross. Well, okay. Yeah. Crux. Yeah, the crux in the manner. Then you mentioned yeah. the cross. There you okay. go. That is the crux. That is the <laughs> cross, right? Yeah, you answered all the objections. When, 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 for God so loved the world. It's right. all past tense. It all points back right. to Calvary. There's no verses in the Bible where God presently loves sinners, lost sinners. Right. There are a couple objections to it with um, where Jesus Christ beheld, I think it was the rich young ruler. It's Mark chapter 10. And it said, Jesus Christ loved him and said, but if thou wilt have treasure in heaven, sell everything and come after me or something like that. But it said, Jesus Christ loved him. Right. So that's really the only verse I found. And we talked about it before, yeah. man, it, it doesn't disprove what we're saying. So, so answer that, Brother Brian, just because that is a good, I've been asked. So somebody I, might think of that. Like, yeah. what about this verse? Right. No, that's a wonderful that is a wonderful verse to bring up. And again, the point of this podcast is for you to think, for us to think, and for us to discuss this and have you consider all these verses. And, and recently I had someone ask me about that verse. I gave them my answer. But what is your answer to that and how Jesus loved that rich young ruler there? And obviously he's a sinner and he's not saved. How would you answer it in light of everything else that we just discussed? Yeah, but in light of this 50, 60, 70 verses we gave, you can't, you don't throw out 70 for one, but also it's Jesus Christ on the earth. Right. It's to the nation of Israel. It's a Jewish man. It is Old Testament. He hasn't died yet. He came into his own, his own received him not. And it's just Jesus Christ on the earth. It wouldn't overthrow all the verses about God and his nature presently from 33 AD when he ascended to heaven in Acts 1 and he hasn't been back since. Hopefully he comes back very quickly. Amen. But from 33 AD to 2021, Going forward, he is not, there's no verse that says he's showing his love present tense. Jesus Christ hadn't died in the cross yet. Right. That's a good one. Yeah. He showed his love on Calvary. Well, Calvary hadn't happened yet. So sure. Jesus Christ on the earth, obviously he can do whatever he wants. He he loved a man on the earth and demonstrated his love to that man by telling him the truth. Well, right. so that, that would be my answer. It's pre-Calvary. It's Jesus Christ on the earth. He's not on the earth now. And all the verses that we say show God's love is only past tense to Calvary. Right. And a man's, a lost man's current condition. Yeah. Would, and I think just that. to add to that thought is, and I know I mentioned this to you again, just like Jesus got hungry, God doesn't get hungry. Just like Jesus got thirsty, God doesn't get thirsty. And so you're dealing with the humanity of Christ there. And so I also believe he serves as an example to you and I in how when we take the truth, right? Jesus gave him the truth. How when we take the truth, and the truth in this age is the gospel, the grace of God. But when we take the truth to lost and our world, we should love them. That should be our motive. But just because Jesus is showing the love of God to him personally doesn't mean that lost sinner, God loves him God the Father loves him in his condition. It simply states that Jesus loved him as a man, as a person. And again, I think that's a great principle, a great application to you and I. When we go to the lost and dying world, we should have a heart that loves them to give them the truth. Speaking the truth 
in love, in love, Paul writes in the book of Ephesians. And so that's how, what I would say. And I think your answer is spot on. There's a dispensational. There's also an, a, an example given to us, but that does not overthrow the, the, all the verses we showed you of man's lost condition before a holy God and their need for salvation. What else you got there? Uh, let's see. I don't know. We're going to talk about how you how you get the love of God, like Romans yeah. eight thirty nine. Yeah, but I I got a couple things in John seventeen with the prayer. Sure. So I'll read one here, Romans five. Then you can take over and do a couple of those verses there, and how okay. we get the love of God. And then what we'll do is once we talk about how you get the love of God, then we'll we'll con- conclude this study up with how God then views the saved person once they get the love of God, right? And then what happens, and, and we'll talk all about that. But I did want to mention Romans 5a because it is an interesting verse, and you got to pay attention uh, to all the words. The Bible says, but God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And someone may take this verse at face value and say, see, God commendeth his love towards us. It shows that God currently loves us. But how does he do it? It says that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God commended his love towards us. Thank God he didn't wait for us to clean up to show us his love, to demonstrate, to commend his love towards us. But again, that goes back to the statement I said, read all the verses. He's writing to Christians. He is writing to Christians. That's a very good point, Brother Ryan. And he's he's explaining what, what God did for us, right? His love towards us. And even beyond that, go back to all the verses where it talks about God's love, and especially you could apply to the the application to sinners. You're going to find out very emphatically, they all point back to the cross of Calvary and what Jesus Christ did for us. So I'll say it again. I'll probably say it one more time before the podcast is over. The love of God is available to all, but it's available at the cross of Calvary. If a sinner rejects Jesus Christ, if a sinner rejects the payment that that God's son did on the cross of Calvary, then listen to me, that sinner rejects the love of God, but it's available. And again, to me, that is such a beautiful message to be able to say the love of God's available if you come to Jesus Christ. So uh, go ahead and uh, I know you had a couple of verses and expound on uh, transition into how we get the love of God. Okay. I uh, mentioned John 17, the Lord's, the real Lord's prayer. Jesus Christ says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Right. And oh, John 17, 23. This is really interesting. I and them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know. It's the lost people. Mm -hmm. Those he's not praying for the world. That the world may know that thou, God the Father, hast sent me and hast loved them. Mm. That's the saved. That's not the world. Right, right, right. Jesus Christ says that God loves those who are saved. That's right. Not the world. Right. As thou hast loved me. So I I noticed that within the last year. I thought that was kind of interesting. And I just have a couple verses on the love of God. Amen. Romans 8, 39. Very familiar verse. And I think this transitions how someone gets the love of God. Right. right? And it shows you if you're not in this condition, you don't have the love of God. Right? And so Brother Brian is going to read this and expound on this. But this is crucial. This is, this is, listen to me, this is where the love of God is found. And this is what we're talking about. We're saying before you come to this position, what he's about to read, then you're not going to experience the love of God. All right, Brother Ryan, go ahead. Where's the love of God found? Well, I just want to remind you, maybe I should do it after the verse, but Ephesians 2.12, the lost, one of their things, I might have read it, I don't know if I did, describes the lost as without Christ. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.12, the lost person is without Christ. So Romans 8.39, nor height, nor what shall separate us. Okay. For I am persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Here we go. Which is in Christ Jesus. That's it right there. And I don't want to hijack this because I want you to expound on this. But right there is where the love of God is found. It is found in Christ Jesus. 
And again, brethren, you don't have to study the Bible much. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to understand that, like you said, the lost person is without Christ. They are not in Christ Jesus, and the love of God is in Christ Jesus. What more do you need? So you you can't have the love of God if the love of God's in Christ Jesus, and you're not in Christ Jesus. But again, what a wonderful message we get to go and declare to a lost and dying world how they can find the love of God, how they can enter into that relationship, whereas you just read, nothing will separate them from the love of God. Amen. So I just have one more same same kind of idea yeah. here. It says Galatians three twenty six. How do you get in Christ Jesus? For ye are all the children of God mm. by faith. That's it. In Christ Jesus. So that's how you get in Christ Jesus, by faith in Christ Jesus, a lost person yeah. without Christ, Ephesians 2.12. But obviously, if you're lost, you don't have faith in Christ Jesus, not the right faith, right. the saving faith. So you're out of the love of God. And th- and that's what we're saying. When we say God does not love sinners, what we're talking about in their present condition as dead, as vile, as lost, as sinners, being enmity between them and God, being enemies of God. Being where God hates them, where he's angry with them. But the good news is we get to tell them how they can be reconciled to God. And that kind of transitions. And we'll talk last about the safe person's condition. But that transitions to what our message should be, Brother Brian. And I'm talking about as New Testament gospel preachers. I'm not talking about as Old Testament prophets Mm -hmm. preaching to the nation of Israel who had the law of God, who knew better. I'm talking about New Testament gospel preachers who are are preaching to lost Gentiles that are in darkness. So with that said, what is our message to them then? What do we preach? That's funny because I... The whole time I keep wanting to add this in and make it clear for for those who don't know us or maybe mm-hmm. most of you probably haven't gone on the streets with us or never heard Pastor Chad preach or I've just preached a few times. You would think from what we're saying, we're like Westboro Baptists or we're like we're these evil mean. Well, we're actually the opposite. Amen. Amen. We are. We're positive. We pre. We're rock when I mean yeah. rock when I street preachers, but we're. We're positive. We have a positive message. Amen. We mention hell. We mention if you die without Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. But if you listen to a street preacher, listen to a sermon, Amen. we'll mention hell. We'll mention the wrath of God, but it's going to be 95% what God did about Amen. it, what God's plan is. Don't go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. Jesus Christ doesn't want That's you to it. go to hell. God doesn't want you in hell. That's why he sent Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, Amen. he gave his only begotten son. He wants to save you. He He doesn't want you in hell. He's got a mansion prepared in heaven to enter thou in the joy of thy Lord, prepared from the foundation of the world. Uh, he sent Jesus Christ. He died for your sins, Amen. was buried, rose again the third day. If you trust Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. You'll have eternal yeah. life. You'll have hope. That's what we preach. We're right. not, we'll mention hell. Well, you, right. you need to mention hell. We tell them they're lost. Right. Well, you're going to burn in hell. You're going to fry. for. We don't do that for 20 minutes and right. make fun and mock. We don't do that. And we're not, we don't, we're, I think we're very gracious. We're, we're very loving. And so, yeah, I would say as far as our crowd, we're about as positive as you can get sure. while not compromising one bit. Amen. And we preach the truth. We preach hell. Pastor Chad's preached on hell. He mentions it regularly in, in, in the church services and that, which is wonderful. It needs to be mentioned. But we're not mock. We don't do right. it mockingly. We're, we don't rejoice over it. We don't uh, laugh about it. And, and it's nothing like that. So sure. you need to mention it, but you need to we're, we're preaching the gospel, which is yeah, and good, glad tidings. <laughs> yeah, amen, brother. And you hit the nail on the head, and th- and that's exactly it. You know, we preach. We are New Testament gospel preachers. We are preaching the gospel. That's how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scripture. Amen. The Bible says that we are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we know what an ambassador is. We're a spokesman of a foreign country. Mm. See, the United States of America. This world's not my home. Listen, one day, brother, we are going home. But until then, the Bible says he's called us with a high calling. He he has given to us, listen, the ministry of reconciliation. He has not given us the ministry of condemnation. You know why, Brother Brian? They're condemned already. It's good. So what we do is we go and tell them, listen, you are condemned already. You are a sinner. But listen, we're here to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ, how he died for your sins, how you can be reconciled to God. He took your place on the cross of Calvary. If you'll trust in him, you'll be saved. And then guess what? 
You'll enter into the love of God. So again, yeah, we okay. preach reconciliation. We preach repentance towards God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We preach Jesus Christ. We preach the cross and we preach the need of salvation. The result of that is if they will trust in Christ, if they'll receive Christ, if they'll believe on Jesus Christ, then they get saved. They get put in Christ and now they enter into the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Right. So when you lay this whole thing out, I believe it's crystal clear that a lost person is not actively in that love relationship. God doesn't actively love them. He loved them enough to die for them. The love of God is available to them. But if they reject the cross, they reject the preaching of the gospel, then they reject the love of God. So that's our message. Man. Tell them how to be reconciled. I would say with the last five minutes, let's talk about what happens to a sinner when they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, we already talked about how that's when they enter into the love of God. But what else happens to them? You know, we talked about all the things they were. But now, what are some of the blessings that happened at salvation, Brother Brian? They're translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Their sins are washed away, Amen. past, present, future. They're Amen. spiritually circumcised. Uh, Second Peter talks about exceeding great and precious promises. There's a home in heaven. Yeah. They're going to get a new body. We have the promise of his Amen. coming, and we're spiritually circumcised. We're in Christ Amen. Jesus. We're in the body of Jesus Christ. How long you want me to go here? This yeah. goes on and on. All the great blessings that we get in Jesus Christ for free, the, the wonderful things. So let's let's compare just, and those are all wonderful. And again, you could keep going and keep going. Let's compare a few of the things we said. They were dead. Now they're what? Alive. They're alive. They were. You have the quicken. Yeah, you have the quicken. They were the sons of the devil. Now they're what? Sons of God. Sons of God. And you just compare and contrast. Before, God was angry at them, and now there's peace by the cross. They were mm. reconciled. They were condemned. Now they're delivered. God used to hate them. Now God loves them. See, all these promises tie in to salvation. Right. It's like the remission of sins, redemption and the home in heaven. You don't get to go to a lost person and say, man, you got a home in heaven and God's redeemed you and God's forgiven you. No, no. You understand that happens at salvation. And all we're saying is that's where the love of God's found also is found in salvation. And so he also what is ex ex now they're accepted in the beloved. Yeah, it's a good one. And they weren't accepted before. <laughs> Here's a real good one. Now they are no longer dead in trespasses in their own filthy wickedness. Now they're given God's righteousness. Mm. Man, just that's we're clothed a, with God's righteousness. One. And again, Brother Brian, I know we could go on and we could go on. They're new creatures in Christ. And all that's done by what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Amen. It's a positive message. So, yeah, very positive. <laughs> and that's why I don't understand the feedback or the kickback when, when we state that God does not love sinners. I think people just react emotionally and don't listen, don't study out what we're trying to say. I think it's a, to interrupt, it's, no, it's a great example of how the world or even worldly Christianity right. or non-Bible Christianity, whatever of all denominations, infects our minds and yeah. we're all guilty of it absolutely all of us with all different thinking good bible even, believing brethren right you know but just any kind of right. thinking with marketing or whatever sure. just hearing something over and over but we're guilty of it i've i've done yeah. it. i've heard something and repeated it right i said for years there's only one book in the bible that ends with a question mark because i heard somebody say that like yeah. 10 years ago and i recently realized no there's two Amen. jonah and nahum or cleanliness is next to godliness if you repeat that, you're ignorant of the fact that that's not in the Bible, but yeah. I don't think you're just some Bible ignoramus moron. I'm sure probably some preachers, maybe some of you that are watching this have repeated that and not realize it's not in the Bible. We're all guilty of having thinking sure. whether it comes from the world or marketing or the Catholic Church. or yeah. There's all different thoughts and things we say and repeat that isn't, and I think that's just one of them, right. and there's so little pushback if zero. My Bible Baptist Church, the only church I ever heard that, where they yeah. actively talked about how that's a lie, that God sure. does not love sinners actively. Right. So you, you hear so little love it it's you just assume it's got to be true because everybody preaches on it yeah so it's that's just how it works <laughs> amen and that's that's a good way to kind of wrap this up and mm -hmm. i will say this in closing just to say it one more time 
there is no doubt how God views lost man. We went through that list. I won't go through the list again, but he is outside the love of God. And, And there's no doubt that mankind held a special place in the heart of God, so much so that God was sent his only begotten son. Praise the mm. Lord for that. Thank you. And Lord. the Lord Jesus Christ took my place, took Brother Brian's place, took your place on the cross of Calvary. And there is where the love of God was not only demonstrated, it is there where the love of God is found. But I'll say it again. If a sinner rejects the Lord Jesus Christ, if a sinner says no to the cross and that payment, then that sinner is rejecting the love of God and they will never experience the love of God on a personal relationship level like a Christian. Listen, thank God when you get saved, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. But again, that's in Christ Jesus. Brother, I'll, cl- I'll conclude with this. Again, you've been given the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of condemnation. This world's condemned already. You need to be like that verse we talked about with Jesus, and you need to love this lost and dying world. But loving them, you need to preach the truth to them, and they need to realize that they're lost without hope and without God and undone in this sinful world. But if they'll come to Calvary, if they'll come to Jesus Christ, he'll save them, he'll wash them, and they'll enter into the love of God. I pray that this podcast challenges you. I pray this podcast encourages you. And as I like to say, do something for the Lord Jesus Christ, for worthy is a lamb. Until next time, God bless. The key to understand the word of God is for the author to show you what the thing says. If you understand that book, you get for the author. Then he opened their understanding.